gives me a great joy, all of you, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, to gather with you here at St. Patrick's for Mass this morning. Don't worry, I have not come to bring any bad news. It seems like every time the Archbishop shows up, everybody freaks out because they think, oh my gosh, he must be coming to tell us something bad. I don't like being associated with bad news, so uh, I've got a couple of wonderful baptisms after Mass this morning, and your pastor, Father Furlow, asked me to celebrate this Mass with you this morning, so it gives me a great opportunity to get out here and visit with you today, and to be with you and to pray with you, most importantly, and to celebrate the greatest of all prayers. You know, these days in the church, we're working our way through the Bread of Life discourse in the sixth chapter of John's Gospel. We've been reading and will continue to read from the Bread of Life discourse of our Lord and Savior. You who have some knowledge of Scripture probably know that interestingly enough, St. John the Evangelist does not include in his Gospel the institution narrative at the Last Supper. The other Gospels, the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all contain what Jesus did at the Last Supper. This is my body. This is my blood. St. John doesn't do this. But St. John gives us probably, if I dare say so, even a more profound teaching around the Holy Eucharist in this sixth chapter of his Gospel where Jesus speaks to us about himself as the bread, the living bread, come down from heaven, so that unlike your ancestors who ate the man in the desert and died, nonetheless, whoever eats this bread will live forever. He will go on to say, my flesh is real food, my blood is real drink. If you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, you have eternal life. And God will raise you on the last day. The Eucharist. The very source, summit, center of our lives as Catholics. During this time of Eucharistic revival, we need to be all the more focused on this most profound gift that Christ has given us, the gift of himself. You know, I had the privilege of being at the National Eucharistic Congress in Indianapolis some weeks ago, and it was amazing. And the most moving moment for me, among many moving moments, was the first night. We had a stadium Filled, this is where the Indianapolis Colts play, big football stadium, filled with 50,000 plus Catholics from all over the United States. And at a certain moment, in the center of the arena, an altar was prepared, candles were lit, and our blessed Lord himself walked in to that assembly carried by Bishop Cousins in the Holy Eucharist. Jesus came in, processed in, and enthroned himself on the altar. And for a long period of time, in a stadium filled with 50,000 people, you could have heard a pin drop. And all eyes and all hearts were fixed on the Eucharist. I've got some great pictures from where I was kneeling myself. Maybe I shouldn't have taken a picture at such a solemn moment, but I couldn't. I had to capture it. The Eucharist. Everything, brothers and sisters. You know, and as we come to this Sunday in the reading of the discourse... It doesn't take a uh, brain surgeon to make the connection between the first reading and the gospel. The prophet Elijah 
is told to go into the desert. He's weak and he's tired and he's ready to give up, really. He's basically had enough. And he, he says to the Lord, look, okay, I, he's kind of like, I'm done. <laughs> Just take me. You know, have you ever had a day like that? <laughs> I can remember one day back in Michigan when I was the bishop there. It was just like one of those days, you know, it was one thing after another. And I can remember, like yesterday, standing in my office, taking that last phone call that just sort of was the straw that broke the camel's back. And I put down the phone. I literally looked up and said, really? <laughs> and I kind of felt like Elijah, I think, you know, oh, Lord, just take me now, <laughs> you know. I think we all sort of feel that way sometimes, like Elijah. I just can't go on. It's too hard. There's too many struggles, too many obstacles. I'm weak. I just don't know if I can do this, Lord. But then the Lord tells Elijah, get up, eat, else the journey will be too hard for you. He got up and he ate. Then he went back to sleep. The Lord woke him up again. Eat. The journey's long. So Elijah got up and ate. And then walked 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb. The implication is with nothing else to eat. But a strengthen on that food that the Lord provided for Elijah, he was able to walk the hard way to the mountain. As I said, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to make the connection to the Eucharist. Brothers and sisters, that's what the Eucharist is meant to be for us who are weary and weak and sinful and selfish and self-absorbed and who find it sometimes just too hard. Jesus comes to us to strengthen us for the journey. Not with physical food. And let's face it, the host is pretty small, and I suspect very low in nutritional value from a natural point of view. But from a supernatural point of view, it's everything. It's all that we need. It's all that we need. Now, the, the implication here, of course, is that life is a pilgrimage, like Elijah, like the people who fed on the manna in the desert for 40 years. Jesus, or God, the Father, sustained them on their journey through the desert for 40 years by feeding them the bread from heaven, the manna. We're on a pilgrimage. We're on a journey. Life is a pilgrimage. We're headed somewhere. Not Mount Sinai, not the promised land of an earthly realm, but the promised land of heaven. Not from slavery in Egypt under cruel taskmasters, but from freedom from the slavery to death and sin and Satan to the gift and the promise of an eternal dwelling made ready for us in heaven. But we need strength along the way. We need to be strengthened along the way. I know I do. And God gives us that strength in the Holy Eucharist to be the food for the journey. You know, some of you might be aware that there's a form of giving, the giving of Holy Communion that is called viaticum. And viaticum is the last Holy Communion that we receive in this life, usually. So when we know somebody is dying, they're close to death, but they're still able to receive the Eucharist, we give them the Eucharist in the form, it's, it's Eucharist, but it's in a prayer form we call viaticum. It's 
mean, the word viatica means for the journey, for the way. For the way from this life to life eternal. But I think viaticum at the moment of death is just a, a sort of a concentration of what the Eucharist is for us in our whole lives. In a certain sense, every communion is a viaticum. It's a food for the journey, for us. Now, it's, it's, it's nice to say that, right? And to believe that and to know that. But do we really believe that? Do we really believe that in the Eucharist is everything that we need? Or is it something that, yeah, okay, that's a nice pious thought, Archbishop. I'll think about that for an hour maybe and then forget it. We shouldn't forget this. You know, as I said, quoting the Second Vatican Council, and look at Vatican II didn't make this teaching up. <laughs> it was just reaffirming what the church always has believed, that the Eucharist is the source and summit of our lives. It's the source. Everything we do flows from the Eucharist. St. John Paul II, his last encyclical, on the Eucharist, Ecclesia de Eucharistia, the church from the Eucharist draws her life. We draw our life from here. We can't live without this. And yet so many do. How is that? Especially once you believe. Once you know what this is. How could you... I, I, don't, I don't understand. I, I share with you, I was coming back from a short vacation recently and I was in the airport. One of those long, dreaded layovers that was not planned. And got chatting with a guy, an older man, and a wonderful guy, and we had a wonderful conversation. In the course of the conversation, of course, we found out who I was, and, and uh, he was a no longer practicing Catholic. Marital situations had sort of complicated his life. And, but he shared with me that he was going to an evangelical church, and uh, he was close to his pastor, and you know, they have coffee once in a while, and, you know, he was very curious about me and where I'm from, and we found out that his uncle is a bishop that I knew, happened to know. And, but, you know, and, and it was one of those moments where you're sitting there thinking, should I say anything? Or should I just be nice and let it go? And I said, no, I just can't sit here and not say anything. So I finally said to him, I, I said, you know, I said, I don't mean to in any way be offensive, but I, just, I want to ask you a question. I'm glad that you have found a church and that you're walking with the Lord. But let me ask you something. Don't you miss the Eucharist? He looked at me and he says, well, we receive, you know, we receive it once in a while. The <laughs> bread and the wine. Of course, I didn't get into a theological debate with him about the validity of orders and all of that, but I said, but it's not the same, is it? You know, and, and he didn't react in a strong way, but I hope that I planted a seed there for him. Start thinking about what he's missing, the source and summit of his life. Everything we do as a church, everything we do as a parish, Everything we do as a family, everything we do as an individual disciple of Jesus comes and flows from the Eucharist and leads us back. That's the source and summit. Strengthening us for daily life and bringing us back here, leading us back here to be strengthened again. It's like a wonderful circle. The church you and I draw our life from the Eucharist. Do we really believe that? I can't live without it. And really, neither can you. I hope you'll always remember that. In the Eucharist, the Council also reminded us, it contained, this is a fascinating way of saying it, I think. The Council's taught that in the Eucharist is the entire spiritual good 
of the church in the Eucharist is the entire spiritual good of the church, namely Christ, our Passover. If we really believe that in the Eucharist is the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ, truly, substantially, really present, and that he humbles himself to come to us and to become food for us, God becomes food for us. It's beyond our wildest imagination. And yet, it's true. So, brothers and sisters, as you face your own challenges in life and struggles, as I face my own, I'm just glad Father Furlow doesn't have any, so... Remember this. Christ the Lord meets us here. Out of his love for us, comes to us to be with us, to be viaticum, food for the journey.